This is it, kids. It doesn't get much more alive than this. This week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes is liver than any of us will ever be. How do you like that view of my ear, huh? Pretty good, eh? Yep, live on the Facebook. And here I am, just like that. No fall to roll, no fancy introduction, no waving anything in front of the camera. None of my standard trademarks except the usual trademark of internet streaming quality. Today is a, a quickie Tent Talks Tunes for sure, maybe even a little bit of a knee trembler, if you will pardon my analogy. Uh, today has been an extremely busy day for yours truly. And once my monitor fires up and I can reach over and stick my forehead into the lens, and make sure that I am indeed going out live, I will tell you all about it. But as, you know, is usual the case with technology, it's moving a lot slower than I am, and mayhap slower than you are. So I'm looking at a blank computer screen with a little wheel going like that. I'm sure we're all familiar with that particular phenomenon. And waiting for the connection to be made so I know that indeed I am connecting with you, my frantic fans, my loyal listeners, my vivacious viewers. I had a delicious breakfast, including lots of fresh cut watermelon earlier today. And what you just saw was a genuine watermelon burp live here on Tent Talks Tunes, presuming that we are going live. Okay, the monitor's kicked in. I'm now going to re reach in real close and intimate to the camera lens, the camera eye, as the much cursed and maligned Canadian rock group Rush would say. And I'm going to make sure that uh, I'm going live. And lo and behold, it looks like I am. Yes, I see that Alan is on board. Matt Vane is on board. I'm just glad to have anybody on board at all because today has been uh, quite a day. I, uh, as you all know, am in the middle of a huge move, uh, moving my entire life from my humble little cabin in the woods out here in Greater Danbury, Connecticut, to a another place, maybe a slightly bigger cabin in the woods, somewhere in the wilderness of North Carolina. And I'm sure you guys know how it is. Every one of you out there has not only watched the little wheel spin ad infinitum on your computer screen or on your phone, but you've also had certain days where just everything comes due at once. Do you know what I mean, Jelly Bean? Everything comes due at once sometimes. Like my thirst for that delicious Danbury tap water. And today was just one of those days. It's like I had to get my oil changed or my car warranty would be voided. I had to do that immediately. I had a big wholesale order that had to go out by five o'clock, do or die. I had to get a permit at the local dump before the moving container arrives tomorrow in the morning and the dump closes at three. Um, you know, it was just any number of things that was going on. So because of all that, I was running around like a nut job. And when I got home after finishing all of those errands successfully, I didn't feel like doing anything at all. I didn't feel like doing nothing, cousin. I felt like just stopping completely. So I did. I just stopped completely. You know, I said, screw this. I'm not doing anything. I am going to take a nap. And that's that. And that was at 5.15 p.m. today. And my eyes opened up voluntarily around 6.30. And I was like, hmm, tent talks tunes, you know. I, you know, I should do it. I don't know if I feel like doing anything at all, but I should do it. And then, you know, I opened up my eyes some more and I said, yeah, you know what? The heck with it. I've, I've got one thing on my mind, one thing on my mind that I want to share with all of you people out there. So it's because of all the circumstances I wasn't able to do my little blurb as I traditionally do on Wednesdays. So sorry for that. 
I'm sure today's audience is going to be smaller than usual because a lot of folks don't know that I'm on, but hey, as Sammy Davis Jr. once said, that's life, that's life, and he said it just like that. Just a real quick spin through the bulletin board today. No mail to report on today because I just haven't been to my regular post office. It's, it was that kind of a day, you know. Um, as you can see, the Almighty Anti Scene are not only on my shirt. And yes, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I am the guy who will wear a shirt depicting himself. I will do it. I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm actually extremely proud of being a full-time member of Anti-Scene, and I love the graphic sensibility of this band. So I am very happy to flaunt it and to strut my stuff as I strut their stuff. No problemo, mejito. No problemo. Anyway, they're on my shirt. They're on the bulletin board. Nothing specific on the bulletin board, but I do have to mention that we are playing the Beer Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia on September, is it 1st? What day is it? I got to look over here. Yep, September 1st, Sunday. We are co-headlining the third day of the Beer Olympics with our freshly minted TKO recording artist pals, the Antiheroes who are back in action and getting ready to swing like only they can swing. There are label mates. I've never met those guys before, but I do remember in the good old days of brick and mortar, trash American style, selling a lot of anti-heroes records and playing them on the turntable and people dug them. I dug them good grooves to be had and um, get to share the stage with them for the first time on September 1st. Very, very exciting. And also looking forward to the great month of October, a run of shows right around Halloween time. Oh, yes, it's going to be anything but weenie around Halloween this year because Anti-Scene is hitting the stage in Louisiana and Texas. Lafayette, Austin, San Antonio, and one other city whose name I've already forgotten because I've been running around like the proverbial vegan headless chicken. But you'll be hearing more about it as time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. So Anti-Scene, September 1st in Atlanta as part of the Beer Olympics. And then at the very end of October, Halloween weekend in Louisiana and Texas. Very much looking forward to that. It's going to be a run of hot rock action. So yeah, on top of all that, I haven't had lunch yet, and I'm starving. My blood sugar level is plummeting rapidly. But um, I do have a point. I do have a hypothesis. I do have a theory. I do have an opinion. And I want to share it with you people and maybe stir some controversy, as they say in Birmingham, England. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We're going to get controversial right here on Tent Talks Tunes before I scamper off and have me some lunch. Now, you guys have heard me talk a lot about many bands, and y'all know that I have a very strong opinion about the almighty Black Sabbath. I mean, come on, who's going to argue with Black Sabbath, you know? The name alone, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the various bones of contention rise to the surface of the soup when we start talking about the various lineups of Black Sabbath, the various singers, the various drummers, the various bass players. And boy, howdy, you can split hairs until you're, you've got a ho you've got a, until you've got a dome that looks kind of like mine. And then you can try to grow more hairs and keep splitting them and get another dome that looks like mine. There's a lot of hair to split when it comes to Black Sabbath and the various lineups thereof. Now, we all know, if you've been watching this show for any period of time, or if you know me personally, I'm a champion of the underdog, and I have a real bordering on morbid, fanatical obsession with the lame duck, the dark horse, the unloved lineups of bands. 
those are the lineups that I always gravitate towards. Those are the albums I always want to listen to first because there's certain lineups of certain bands that never got respect, were quite often disliked, um, never got a chance. And, you know, in the interest of fair play, not to mention my real fascination with these kinds of things, I want to hear what these bands and these lineups have to offer. I want to see what it is that your average Joe and Josephine out there doesn't care for, you know, because as we all know, the majority goes with the swill. The majority goes for the most trite, the most obvious, the easiest to digest, the most blatant, obvious talking points that the influencers tell them that they're supposed to like. If, if Rolling Stone says it's good, therefore it's good. That kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing. We already know about the most obvious phases of a band's era. In Black Sabbath, it's the Aussie phase. We already know, yes, yeah, groundbreaking, awesome. We, we already know that. And it's true. Of course it's true. You, you, can't, you cannot deny the legacy of the Ozzy Osbourne era of Black Sabbath. That is to say, the 1969 to 1977, or as Ellie goes so far as to say 78, the 69 to 78 era of Black Sabbath, the original era. That cheesy, retrograde, cash-in, so-called reunion album, 13, doesn't count. That doesn't count for Jack. When you have an album that's nothing but rewrites of old songs, doesn't count. And I don't care how many influencers say that it was a magnificent return to form. I mean, it's incredible to hear the original guys together at their peak. I'm calling bullshit on that. Bill Ward's not even on that record. Okay. And Rick Rubin's mandate to Black Sabbath when making that record was to make a record that sounds just like your first record. Who cares? Who could possibly care about that? It's been done already. It's been done already. And it was done better in 1969. Okay. Now let's see. I'm getting some comments here. Well, Jenny DeSoto says, hey. Rick Del Santo says, hey. Mike Lester says, hello, sir. Neil in Buffalo, New York, who is always a contrarian. I'm calling you out now, Neil. I am calling you out. He says that 13 was satisfactory. Admit it. Well, you know what? I'll give you that, man. It was definitely satisfactory. It was a very satisfactory piece of product. As far as product goes, designed to stoke a record company's bottom line, it was quite satisfactory. Very satisfactory. So, okay, Neil, you're right. Maybe it wasn't just relentless hokum from start to finish. Maybe it was indeed a satisfactory piece of plastic. And I do mean plastic. I think I've been doing nothing but... I've, either I've been doing nothing except digressing this whole time, or I've been gradually circling, circling around to make a point. Let's see where this goes. Remember, hectic day, no time to prepare, blood sugar's running dangerously low, I might be getting punchy here. So yeah, the original Black Sabbath, Ozzy, Tony, Geezer, Bill... Of course, it's one of the pinnacles of human achievement. But as things happen, you know, bands change lineups. Members come and go. Um, points of view change. Times change. Styles change. And we all know that Black Sabbath has gone through many, 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 many changes over the years. And certain eras are definitely more popular than other eras. Of course, after the Ozzy era, you've got the Dio era. The extremely exalted, much-loved... Dio era, and the debate rages eternal between Ozzy and Dio, Ozzy and Dio, Ozzy and Dio. Well, I've come to a conclusion, and I, I came to this conclusion not too long ago when I was in the touring van with Profanatica, and our driver, a really super cool guy named Nate, who had very good taste in music, was in charge of the music for a lot of the time, and he played a lot of the Dio era 
albums, which were only two. There was Mob Rules and there was Heaven and Hell. And you could count Dehumanizer, and I don't count Heaven and Hell. Because Heaven and Hell, The Devil You Know, that album was also another piece of try to please the critics, try to shift a lot of units, try to recapture past glories, inferior retread product. It's about nine hours of the most dull, leaden, boring thump and plod that my ears have ever been tortured with. And I tried to listen to it. I really did. I tried once on a drive from New Jersey to Connecticut. Midway through the first song, I hit the skip button. Midway through the second song, I hit the skip button. Midway through the third song, I hit the skip button. You know, and that's why I was able to get through the Heaven and Hell album in about 15 minutes. It was really easy. Man, that shiz was tedious. So, okay. You got Mob Rules, you got Heaven and Hell, you got Dehumanizer. The holy triumvirate of Dio records. We listened to every single one of them. And I realized, after many years of not really thinking about it, that each one of those albums is basically okay. They're okay. Each one of those albums has got songs that absolutely kill. That just kill. Like on Heaven and Hell, you've got All of Side One. Incredible. On Mob Rules, you've got the title track. In Sign of the Southern Cross. You know, Voodoo. you got some really good songs on there. Dehumanizer, you've got I, Computer God, Time Machine. Those are great songs. You could have taken every good song from those three Dio albums and made one astonishingly good Dio album with maybe a few left over to make a pretty good second album. And after that, just forget it. Like the heading on my broadcast says, Unpopular Black Sabbath Opinions. Let's see, Neil has chimed in saying that he will give me the final word. Thanks, Neil. Mighty big of you. I would expect no less from a resident of Buffalo, New York. So, okay, we've determined that the Aussie era is justifiably untoppable. The Dio era was about half amazing, half meh. What else does that leave? Well, you know, you've got the Seventh Star album. You've got the, the so-called um, Black Sabbath album. It's supposed to be a Tony, Tony Iommi solo album. If you want to know about the twisted Byzantine dealings of the record company, just look up the story of that album and how it came to be called Black Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi. It'll give you an ulcer. What does that leave us? That leaves us the basically unsung, unheralded, kind of flew under the radar, Tony Martin era of Black Sabbath. And I'm going to tell you right now, kids, the first time that I saw that lineup of them, actually the only time, I should say, um, opening night of the Cross Purposes tour in 1994 at the Sting in New Britain, February 8th, it was a total snowstorm outside, verging on a blizzard. It was at a venue called The Sting in New Britain. And, like, the show was completely underpublicized. Nobody knew it was going to happen. I ran a record store. And the only reason I knew that the show was happening is because somebody, somebody told me, some random customer came in and said, hey, Black Sabbath's playing at uh, The Sting in New Britain. I was like, really? Wow, that's pretty cool. We better go get tickets right now before it sells out. So we went out and bought four tickets. One for me, one for my business partner, Kathy, and two for anybody else who wanted to go along with us. So I spent the next few weeks saying, hey guys, Black Sabbath is playing at the Sting in New Britain. Come on, let's go. I got two tickets. And the first question that anybody asked was, oh wow, is Ozzy singing? It's like, dude, if Ozzy was singing, they would probably be playing the New Haven Coliseum or the Hartford Civic Center or, you know, Madison Square Garden, they're not going to be playing at the Sting in New Britain, Capacity 600. Oh, Ozzy's not singing? Oh, I don't think so, man. 
we ended up going to the show with two unsold tickets because no one wanted to go. I mean, come on. Scott LaRock is chiming in with a comment. Do, 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 do. If bands are not intimate and accessible to each other, the product is bound to suffer. We'll get to that in a minute. Valid point, Scott. Very valid point, but we'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, we get there and, um, you know, okay, yeah, there's a blizzard going on, but also the show was not publicized. You know, I'm, I'm just a record score guy, store guy with a, a strong hard rock and heavy metal audience. And I'm telling people that Black Sabbath is playing at the Sting in New Britain and nobody knew about it. I didn't even know there was a new album out. If I recall correctly, that very day, you know, memories do get hazy. This was 1994. We're talking about 30 years ago. I kind of want to say that that very day, I got a promo of the album in the mail from the record label, but I know for sure I hadn't heard it yet. So I was kind of aware that there was a new album out. Um, it turns out that the album wasn't even officially out. It didn't come out for another couple of days. But even so, the album just came and went. The label did not promote it. There was zero promotion on the album Cross Purposes. It just, they just kind of tossed it out there and forgot about it. So whatever, Black Sabbath's playing live at the Sting in New Britain, a 700 seat venue. And um, there we are with a venue that was maybe a little more than half full, a little more than half full, which I thought was pretty cool. And it was like having Black Sabbath to yourself, basically. And, you know, at this time, it was Tony Iommi, Geezer Butler, and I didn't know who else. I had no idea who else was in the band at this time. Because, you know, Black Sabbath already had a real heavy-duty revolving door policy. And the record label wasn't doing jack to promote the album, so I didn't even know who's going to be on the stage. So the band comes out. Sure enough, it's Geezer over there, Tony Iommi over there, and I kind of knew the lead singer's name. I thought the lead singer's name was Paul Martin because I just had this vague awareness that, okay, the guy's name is something Martin. I think it's Paul Martin. Not sure. And the drummer's name was written on the double drum heads. It said Bobby Rondinelli. So, okay, drummer, Bobby Rondinelli, whoever that is. I don't know. But they came out, they opened up with Time Machine from the Dehumanizer album. And from that opening riff, and the second that Tony Martin, ah, Tony Martin hit the stage, I was hooked. I was like, man, this is really good. This is a great song. That dude can sing. And this is great. I got Black Sabbath, such as it is, right there in front of me. And it's not a giant coliseum. It's not a huge arena. This is like really intimate. This is really happening. This is awesome. I'm loving this. So I became, I became a fan right then and there of this guy, Tony Martin, and whatever album he was on. So, you know, the days elapse. I get a chance to wrap my head around um, Cross Purposes, give it a listen. And I thought there were four or five really killer tunes on that, and the rest was, eh, you know, ballads. I don't do ballads. I hate ballads. I don't do ballads by anybody. I don't care what band you are. If it's a ballad, I ain't doing it. Power ballads, I do even less of. Don't do it. So, I've decided I like this lineup of the band. I like this album that's come out. So I want to get to know more. I want to get to know more. So in the pre-internet age, this was kind of difficult. But I was able to find out, you know, there's an album called Headless Cross, an album called Tear... Um, and of course we knew the, the whole dehumanizer thing and now this cross purposes thing is happening. And I just started getting more and more into the Tony Martin era of the band and finding more and more music that I really liked. And so it just kind of stood there for a very long time. That's just kind of where it was. Because in my opinion, the albums Headless Cross and Tear, very good albums, a lot of good songs in there. Not a one of them is a soccer Rooney from start to finish. You know, that's kind of like the Sabbath standard since technical ecstasy, basically. You know, that's just the way it is. Not every album they've done has been chock full of killers from start to finish. 
but there's some really good songs on there. My beef with the production on those two albums, they're very 80s, very keyboard heavy, definitely not my style, but it doesn't hide the fact that there are good songs in there. And tracking down the bootlegs from that era, which nowadays in the YouTube era is a lead pipe cinch, I really enjoyed listening to the live recordings of those songs because they were a little bit less keyboard heavy, a little more guitar and bass heavy, and a little more, you know, Black Sabbath such as it is. A year goes by, the Forbidden album comes out, and I immediately liked that album a lot better than anything else from that era. I thought it was a damn good record with more good songs per capita than any Sabbath album I'd heard in a very long time. Once again, the production was a problem. The production, the production was very flat, very cardboard. It was hard to put a finger on exactly what was wrong with the production. Um, because all the song, all the sounds were there. Like everything that was supposed to be there was there, but it just sounded very flat and very dull. And if you go into the history of the recording of that album, you will once again get into this really ridiculous wormhole of how the album ended up the way it did and why it ended up the way it did and the problems with it. I mean, everything from the record label to management to production choices. I mean, you know, interband politics. Forget it. If anything could have been done half-baked on that record, it was done, except for the songwriting. The songs on that album kill. It was just always kind of a struggle to make it through the whole album because the production was so weak. So you fast forward to this year, 2024, and the long-awaited boxed set of the Tony Martin years which has been talked about for five or six years at this point, easily, finally comes out. And the crown jewel of the collection is the remixed, not only remastered, but remixed from the ground up version of Forbidden, done by Tony Iommi himself. Now that was something I was very keen on hearing because the bootlegs from that tour, excuse me, brought out a lot of the power of those songs when they were played live. There's a bunch of soundboard recordings from that tour. I think there's one or two FM broadcasts. And you can really hear the potential of these songs. The only problem being that Tony Martin, it's, it's pretty well documented that right before the Cross Purposes tour, he blew his voice out. I read something somewhere about a throat infection. I'm, I don't really know exactly what it was. But somehow he, he blew out his voice and he had to struggle through that tour and never quite recovered after that for the Forbidden Tour. And you can tell, like, on some of the shows, he is spot on. He sounds great. On other shows, it's more of a slog. But on the album, he's magnificent. And the same thing with Cross Purposes. Like, in the studio, dude nails it every single time. Nails it. And so now... We've got this remixed version of this incredibly maligned, despised album that I think I'm the only guy on the planet who likes. You listen to interviews by the guys in the band, and they don't like it. I like the record. I want to hear this thing. So I finally get it. Very eagerly press the play button on track one. A song called Illusion of Power. And, well, got to digress for a second, because here comes Harry. Where does he come here? Maybe he's disappearing. Well, there he is. We haven't seen Harry in a couple of weeks. Let's say hi to the camera hog himself. The one, the only, the one-eared wonder, the guy with one and a half fangs himself, the yellow-eyed beast, Harry the cat. Hi. Yeah, we see the hearts and thumbs on the screen when Harry makes his appearance. Nobody wants to hear me yammer on and on about Black Sabbath, but everybody loves Harry. Everybody is just wild about Harry. And Harry is just wild about, well, getting his chin scratched, I think. I think that's the extent of what Harry's wild about. 
Greg Crawford has pointed out that Ice-T rapped on that song. I think Ice-T did more of like a three or four sentence monologue on that song. I wouldn't call it a rap. But yeah, Ice-T is on the song, and the band caught an awful lot of stick for that. It was yet another half-baked idea by some stupid record company trying to, cr trying to cash in on a dumb craze. You know, because rap, alternative rock, metal crossover was all the rage in the 90s. And so the cretinous goons at IRS Records said, well, you know, we can sell some more Black Sabbath records if we have a rap crossover, because everybody else is doing it. And if everybody else is doing it, well, Black Sabbath should do it too, because they'll sell more records that way. Typical record company thinking. And so they got Ice-T to do a cameo on that song, and everybody hates it. I say, what's wrong with it? It's like a four-sentence monologue. Big deal. It doesn't destroy the song. It doesn't tank the album. It doesn't really add anything to it. It's not really necessary, but whatever. Was the vocal chorale necessary on the song Superzar? Split hairs. Split hairs. Split hairs. I got precious few, but I'm really ready, ready, willing, and able to split them. Pissy Chrissy's tuned in, she says, soon to be recording artist Harry. Yes, that's right. This mellow fellow right here is going to have his own CD out soon. Once everything is packed into the storage and moving container, I'm going to be sitting in basically an empty house with nothing to do except put together TPOS releases that have been on the back burner for a long time. So... You've been warned. Tell me this guy's not a star. He's a star. Anyway, so yeah, Ice T's on it. So what? Ernie C produced it. Well, apparently, he didn't have a very easy time of it either, because he's caught in the middle of all this jive, you know? The record company, the management, the backstage politics behind getting back together with Ozzy, and, you know, it's just like all this bullshit going on and this band is expected to make a record I'd say the fact that they got anything done at all is little short of miraculous let alone that the songs on it are so damn good they're so good anyway I press the button illusion of power cues on you hear that guitar riff and then all of a sudden the bass and the drums kick in and it explodes out of the speakers oh my god I kind of went like this Harry went like that. That was what I was waiting to hear my entire life. Those awesome songs on Forbidden exploding out of the speakers with clarity, with sharpness, with dynamics, with a kick drum you can finally hear for the first time after almost 30 years. Definition on everything. Separation on everything. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh. It sounds literally, in the true sense of the word, awesome. And it kind of makes me think, you know, maybe if Ernie C had been given a chance and had the time to mix it properly himself, maybe it would have sounded that way. But by cracky, I'm here to tell you, Tony Iommi finally got the job done. It is fantastic. Killer, killer album. And, as I mentioned earlier, per capita, it's got more good songs on it than any other Black Sabbath album after Sabotage. I'm standing by that. And so that sent me down the wormhole yet again. I started tracking down the various bootlegs and stuff from the Tony Martin era, and I found one in particular, a BBC concert recording from the Headless Cross tour in 1989, Perfect, perfect recording and engineering. It sounds so good, it's not even funny. Um, and it is Cozy Powell on the drums, Neil Murray on the bass, Tony Martin on vocals, and of course Tony Iommi on guitar. Look it up, it's on YouTube. You listen to that recording, and you listen to that band's performances of every song in that set, and you tell me that was not a 
And here comes the profanity. I don't use profanity unless I feel strongly about an issue. Tell me that was not a fucking good band. A fucking good band. And I listen to more recordings from different eras. And I'm here to tell you right now, kids, I'm stating it as whomever is my witness that the Cozy Powell, Neil Murray, Tony Martin, Tony Iommi lineup of Black Sabbath was the best post Ozzy lineup that band ever had. They were the best. Cozy Powell had a groove and a swing to his playing that Vinny Apice did not and that Bobby Rondinelli did not and that Terry Chimes did not. Rondinelli and Apice were more like thump, bump, clunk, lump, bump, hump, you know. Terry Chimes was very dry and very clipped. And they're all good drummers. I'm not saying they're terrible drummers. They're just not the best Black Sabbath drummers. Because Bill Ward had the swing. And Bill Ward had that looseness and the groove. And Cozy Powell had a lot of that. He could also do the thump and bump. He was, I think, really the only Sabbath drummer who could handle both styles and do it really well. The only other guy who came close was Bev Bevan. Bev Bevan had a real good swing to his playing. So honorable mentions to Bev Bevan. Neil Murray, once again, one hell of a bass player. And um, I will say that Geezer Butler's performances on the Cross Purposes tour were, of course, fantastic. But his bass tone was so thin and high end. There was no bottom end to his playing. It was all this clank, clank to it. You could really hardly even tell there was bass going on most of the time. Neil Murray, bottom end to the max, excuse me, very fluid, very flowing, very tasty bass lines. Man, that guy could play a song. Listen to his performance of War Pigs on that Manchester FM broadcast. And if you don't get goosebumps, you don't have a goose. Just saying. Tony Iommi, enough said. You don't have to. You don't have to explain anything about Tony Iommi. Tony Martin, when he was in his prime before 1994, when he blew his voice out, that dude could sing anything. He could sing it perfectly. He could sing it with his own style, with charisma. Maybe his between song banter wasn't that great, but. As he would be the first to admit, he was just basically a local guy tossed into the deep end when he got the call to be the lead singer for Black Sabbath. He was learning on the job, you know. But as far as his performances, I dare you to find fault with them. Because you're not. And even in the later years, after he'd blown out his voice, there were moments when he hit everything and the combination was totally right. And it soared. And even when it didn't, I will listen to Tony Martin with a bad larynx over the pseudo-operatic, screeching, gotta hit every high note every second of every day warbling of guys like Jeff Fenholt, Ray Gillen, and... God bless him because he was tossed into an impossible situation, Glenn Hughes. There's a lot of L.A. damage after Black Sabbath relocated there, and they went through this phase of L.A. hair metal, and every singer that they tried out just had to screech their lungs out and hit every high note every second of every day. Man, that stuff gets unbearable after about a minute. Yeah, Tony Martin could do that, but he also had restraint, and he had class, and he had dynamics, and he had range. And he had his own style. So that's it. After all that, after being on the air for what? 40 minutes when I didn't even know if I was going to go on today. After 40 minutes of ranting and raging and railing and raving... 
I delivered the punchline to this week's Tent Talks Tunes, and that is that the Cozy Powell, Tony Martin, Neil Murray, Tony Iommi lineup of Black Sabbath was the second best lineup overall behind the Aussie lineup. You can pour that in a bucket and take it to the well. Listen. Hear for yourself. Get past some of the cheesy production on those albums. Get past some of the roughness of the live performances later on. And what you hear is quality music that stands up with anything produced under the name Black Sabbath. Hmm. And yes, as Greg Crawford says, you got to give a shout out to Jeff Nichols on the keyboards. Bass player, songwriter, guitarist, jack of all trades, definitely the unsung hero of Black Sabbath from the very late Ozzy era all the way to the end of the era when they stopped being a creative, forward moving force and became nothing but a nostalgia act. A very well moneyed nostalgia act, but nevertheless a nostalgia act. I don't do nostalgia. I look forward. I move ahead. I like to give the past a slip. Creatively. Just saying. So that's it, guys. It was a quickie knee trembler tonight, but I got it done. Because I'd always rather be the guy who says, yes, I will, than sorry I didn't. And man, I'm hungry. I'm starving. I gotta get some food in me. So I'm gonna get lunch going on. Yes, I said lunch because I'm on Rockstar Hours. Thanks, guys, for listening to my yammering, as is prone to happen every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on the Facebook and archived forever on the YouTube channel. I'm going to go play me that remastered version of Forbidden right now, and I'm going to crank it loud. And I'm sure it'll still be reverberating in the atmosphere next week when I sign on here on 10 Talks Tunes. And by the way, don't forget, Tuesdays, 7 p.m., Jeff Clayton, my boss in anti-scene, does his thing with Break On Through, where he does, where we both do the same thing. We just talk about music and fanboy geek stuff from our own perspectives. So I'll be tuned in. Hopefully you will be too. That's Tuesday and Wednesday, quality streaming internet entertainment. I should be back in about 167 hours to we meet again. This is Malcolm Tent, that guy right there. Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.